Welcome back to Makers on Tap. We're here for our 45th episode. Uh, tonight, you've got me, Joe, as your host, and with me is... Aaron. Uh, it's just us two tonight. What are you drinking, Aaron? I have... For one thing, I'm on my second crawler. of will re-record Aaron's back. Yes. I have Industries brand new cream ale that they have on tap. It is a nitro draft, and Michelle said they don't normally put their nitros in a crowler, but she did it for me. Oh, it's because she knows you're an alcoholic, and she trusts that you'll drink it immediately. Yes. She's like, <laughs> you're drinking this tonight, right? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it is a it is called the shareable. It is a strawberry nitro cream ale. Ah. Huh. And it is amazing. Is it better than the strawberry kiwi stuff that they had? Because I wasn't a fan of that. Yes. I definitely like it more than the apricot wheat they had. All and right. that was my leading favorite. I'm excited to try this. All right. And then I am back to the Hoptronics from New Holland with its Space Invaders hoppy guys. Tonight, we've got a couple fun news things for you guys. All things that I'm very excited about. Um, two of the topics are slightly old because they came out right after our episode last week. Um, Aaron, you want to take the first one? Sure. So I'm sure a lot of you already heard, but the Raspberry Pi 4 was released. This recent revision has, you know, several different tiers of uh, RAM. So you have one, two, and four gigs version. Uh, one little tidbit you, you may or may not have seen, but. In the manual, it hints at an 8 gigabyte version. I'm very excited about this thing. Mostly for a silly reason. No more micro USB power connectors. I have torn so many of those off just trying to like plug them in behind a printer or something. You like get it kind of at a funky angle and you just tear the pads right off. Now you've got two micro HDMI pads to just tear off. I'm just, I'm hoping their solder pads are better, but you'll probably be disconnecting those less. So the biggest updates to this are the gigabit ethernet on its own PCIe lane. Yeah. Speed tests have gotten full, you know, 940 ish, 960, uh, you know, megabit per second throughput. Um, you get USB three with its own lane. It's relative. It's about four times faster than the raspberry Pi three. But that comes at a cost, right? It certainly does. So now that we are a week and a half in, uh, a lot of people have gotten their hands on the latest pies, and they're starting to see there's a lot of thermal issues. Gina, who does the development for Octoprint, um, posts on Instagram a FLIR image capture, uh, which is a, uh, a thermal heat map um, yeah. picture. And she's pointed right at her Raspberry Pi 4, which has a heat sink on it. So it's got, I believe it's one of the bigger heat sinks you can put on a Pi. So with the giant heat sink at idle, it's running at 53.8 degrees Celsius, which is way too hot just for idle temps. It's like 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. I mean, I most most PC builders aim for like, what, 60? Yeah. Like 60 to 70 for like, that's that's as high as you go. Else you risk, you know, you know throttling due to temps curious how they're dealing with it yeah yeah i i heard that the uh the raspberry pi foundation is going to be releasing a firmware update for raspbian that will maybe help a bit with that but it, it sounds like it might only be like five ish degrees celsius worth of improvements so we'll see how that goes yeah it's hard to deal with thermal issues with software unless you're just gonna change the clock speed we'll see all right other news things things i'm excited about things i'm really excited about the next two topics one, Piper Infinity, or the Piper 4, has just been released. So, the Piper series of 3D printers, we talked to talked about them in the past. They use an EMT conduit-based frame. So, they're very cheap to build um, and very cheap to scale larger. And this one is a belt printer. Woo! Everyone knows Aaron and I are excited about belt printers. Um, I still have yet to build one, and that's frustrating. I don't know if this one will be it, but it does have some interesting features. Um, and Alex Balaco 
from the Piper Project uh, recognized my name from the show as soon as I joined the Piper Facebook group to look for more information on this. And he gave me a nice feature list. Um, is is he on the belt printer forum? I don't know. Alex, did you know that there's a belt printer forum that is manned by us? And, you know, it's pretty fun. Yeah, you should get that on the belt printer forum. That's exactly what I made it for. Yes. Um, infinite printing things. But quick feature list that Alex gave me. Uh, it's made of EMT conduit. Again, of course, it's a Piper. Uh, but this one has a Core XY motion system. It has a magnetic belt system, which starts stops the parts from rocking on the belt, which is, according to Alex, is a problem with the White Knight and the Black Belt printers, where oh. the the belt is actually flexing and allowing the part to lift as it's being printed. Interesting. I haven't seen these things happen, but I also haven't used a belt printer, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't notice something like that at a show. I've never looked for it. Interesting. So I'm I'm curious about that. Yeah. Um, the game on the belt printer forums. Yes, I, we should do a whole study on it. Everyone should send us a belt printer. I will print the crap out of them and then evaluate them. You know, yeah. Beta test and Joe. That's what I do. And then um, it's got a 45 degree gantry. And this uses a regular E3D V6 extruder. So the extruder is at 65 and a half degrees to the belt and the printing service. So this one doesn't have a custom hot end like the White Knight does. White Knight has a custom machined nozzle to allow for the clearance. And he's just using standard off the shelf E3D oh. V6s. Right. Yeah. So there's no, there's no bevel cut in the nozzle. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. So that in itself is interesting to me. Uh, yeah. That and the the magnetic belt system. And it looks like he actually has a source that he's releasing for his belt uh, where you can buy one on the, the Piper uh, Facebook group. So I'm also interested in that. That's something that nobody else has come up with yet is a place I can go click buy for a belt. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the biggest uh, challenges with White Knight from when I was talking to Carl. Yeah. Um, because with BuildTac, they were wanting, you know, a couple hundred dollars because it's it's a super custom size. And until they, you know, got a group buy or more demand, could they bring it down? Yeah. So, um, and then uh, the last really cool thing, um, you guys know that uh, I've been working on the tool, the E3D tool changer for quite a while. Um, they just released open source the tool changer components of that printer. So uh, these are what will be the actual tool changer components. Uh, I've heard that they're going to change it slightly for the tool changer components that are meant to go on other printers uh, to make it more adaptable, more easily adapted. Uh, but these are the tool changing components that will be released on the E3D version uh, in the coming weeks. So this is not the motion system and not the actual physical components, but just the uh, tool changing pickup head itself uh, oh. that they've released on GitHub. Uh, but yeah. this is probably the most complete open source thing I've seen somebody release. They've released steps, they've released STLs, DXFs and PDFs of all of these parts. So if you wanted to go manufacture them on your own or modify them on your own, this is the most freely available CAD release I've seen in a very long time. I'm pretty excited about it. So do they plan on releasing the rest of the printer? Yes. The rest of the motion system, I should say. Yeah, all of the files will release on the same day that the first tool changers ship. Okay. Basically, they just don't want somebody to beat them to the punch after all this work. No, oh, yeah, I totally understand. Yeah. I really think, you know, in this in this age of uh, building a business on open source, you really can't afford to release anything until you actually start, you know, to ship product. Oh, definitely. Because anytime you release it, you're running the risk of somebody beating you to market. Yep. Yeah, and in that same light, I got asked to add patent pending to a project that I've been working on 
for somebody today. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, I feel so dirty. I mean, I will because <laughs> you're going to pay me. But uh, okay. <laughs> you, you're going to have to charge. You have to like send them an invoice for the uh, the closed source uh, surcharge. Anytime you work on something that's not open source, it's an extra like 50% on top of what you quoted. It's like the dirty car charge that I used to charge people when I did car audio. Like it, <laughs> Exactly. If I had to move trash in your car to work on it, it's an extra 50 bucks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, I literally made the, uh, all right, the noise when I saw the email come through. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. All right. So tonight... Our topic um, is poignant to conversations that I've been having with someone today. And it's basically the methods that Aaron and I use to approach learning a new software tool um, or a new method where we're very, very good at something, at accomplishing a task using one tool, and then we're going to switch over to another tool and how we approach learning that tool and not getting frustrated and angry. Does that make sense? Like a description? You're, you're looking at me like, I don't know about that. Uh, I get frustrated and angry all the time. Well, all right. But frustrated to the point where it's just not productive anymore. How's that? Yeah, okay. Okay. I don't get frustrated and angry. I I have the patience of a saint for things like this. That's why I've like doing it anyway uh so you just picked up a new uh electronics design tool right yeah so quick project update ah yeah yeah slight tangent i just finished the circuit board design for the makerspace access control system Yay! so after about a month of trying to figure out KiCad or trying to figure out Patcher, I finally spent some time on Easy EDA. Just after a couple hours of just poking around the UI and just seeing what things do, I was able to throw together exactly what I wanted, which is just a whole PCB of just through whole components and traces between them. So it only took me about four ish hours. And I had uh, an entire circuit board designed with all of my through hole components for, uh, and it was, like I said in the previous episode, it's just female pin headers and that's it. And then just traces in between all of those. And the great thing about easy EDA, it's everything that I expect patcher will be. I was able to select multiple components. I could copy them, you know, paste them and they all copied just as I way I expected I can draw them around. The wiring was really interesting. You could easily, you could either manually, like you know, create a trace between a couple pins, or you can select a pin, uh, assign it to a net. Which in electronics design, it's like a common wire between all these connectors. So if you you added like you know four or five pins to a net, you're telling the software that those four or five pins are connected, even though they're not visibly connected in the software. And then when you go to route them or trace them, the software figured out for you. So Easy EDA has a nice auto trace feature, and it work it only works with nets, I believe. So instead of just manually like, creating traces for everything, when I wanted to connect one pin to another pin, I just put both those pins on their own unique net. Then when I click auto trace, it will then connect the two automatically in the most appropriate fashion. So using that, I was able to create my entire PCB for the Make Reset Control System, and I was able to get five of them ordered on Saturday, and we're now recording this on Tuesday, so they should be here within like a couple days. So I'm hoping by next episode, I actually have an actual prototype that I can, you know, talk about and show you some of the firmware that I've done. But that, ha- that happened so quick. I know. that that's it, It's kind of a testament to how great Easy ADA is. It's kind of my new go-to for quick prototype circuit board designs, which is kind of why we're bringing this up for the show tonight, yep. which is, you know, I, I mentioned last episode, I spent roughly eight whole hours in YouTube tutorials to learn KiCad. And this isn't really, this isn't really a dig at KiCad because it's, from what I've 
seen of KiCad and what I've learned, it's it's really nice software. It's it's professional grade, you know, electronics design software, but I'm not a professional and I don't know all the ins and outs. And now I, I've kind of forgotten just a little bit of how to do all the stuff. And even after spending eight hours, I still felt intimidated trying to get my design done in KiCad. Whereas Easy EDA, you know, you're just given a, you know, a blank window with, you know, a square for your board design and you have components. You can look up components from suppliers or components that users have submitted. And then just some random, you know, buttons for make some traces, make some pads, whatever. And just, just fiddling with that. That's really all I wanted was I just, I, I just want something simple. Because I'm not doing anything fancy with this. I just want to make some through components and connect them with traces. And that's it. I don't really need the schematic because I know what it's doing. I don't really need all the fancy abstraction that KiCad does. I just, I just want to make something simple. I was able to do that with Easy EDA. How did you go about figuring out Easy EDA? I'm pretty sure I said this already, but you know, Easy EDA was simple enough that I didn't have to watch any tutorials. Like just poking around the UI for a bit, you can kind of figure out what things do. There's some easy buttons for adding, you know, pads. And then there's options for the pads to either just be surface mount pads, or you can send them all the way through the board, which then becomes a through hole. Um, You can add traces, which is just point and click, and then click where they end. You can just make squares for like random I used I used the random squares for dimensioning like my RFID dev board. I measured that with my calipers and then I just drew a square and then I measured where the pins go and I added those so I was able to kind of easily dimension out where they go and then kind of move them around. Like I said earlier, I used the net feature to enable auto tracing for all my wires. Yeah. Um that was super easy. Like I just click on a pin and there's a little net box. And I just give it a unique name. And then I just make sure I replicate that name on the second pin. And then somewhere on the top, there's a drop down for like fancy features. And they've got auto routing. You just click that and uh, you can either use their cloud auto routing or there's a, you can download a, a local server that you can run and you can auto trace on your local machine because they have kind of limited resources for their cloud server. You know, like I said, just poke around and I was able to figure it out within like an hour or two. And I'm, I'm not an electronics expert and I was able to figure it out. Um, at least at least for this software, just poking around was sufficient for me to make it work. And that for me is a very good indicator for how well a software works and how well it's laid out. Um, if I can't figure it out, just poking around, then I get kind of frustrated because now I have to read the manual or I have to, you know, look up some guides or read or watch some YouTube tutorials. And that takes a lot of time. Now, as a software engineer, good UIs and good software doesn't need tutorials and doesn't need explained. Yeah, You should just be able to figure it out. And I was able to just to figure it out with this. And that's why I like easy EDA now. I will say some software is so complicated that you can't just rely on the UI to make it uh, I would argue that's not good software, but I, I know you're probably talking about CNC stuff. CNC stuff, things like Photoshop, things like Blender, where there's just there's so much functionality, so much that there's just no way to make the UI completely intuitive. There's just no way, and there's so there's mountains of functionality. Agree to disagree. All right. My section of this is going to be learning a new CAD software. So one of our friends is having issues. He's going from a very simple CAD software. I wouldn't even call it a CAD software. It's a 3D model editor, uh, something like 3D Builder or Tinkercad. And moving into a more full-featured CAD software, uh, something like Fusion 360 or the other cloud one that I can't think of the name of. Sure, we'll call, we'll say SolidWorks. For Creo. Now. Not that one. The cloud one. On shape. Uh, on shape. Yes, there it is. That one. Yeah. All, all three of those things work the same, but different. And um, it's important when 
you have expertise in one thing, even if it's, uh, we could say, going from SolidWorks to Fusion 360. Um, but something so vastly different, uh, but but the same, that you don't spend a lot of time expecting it to work like the other software that you want. So from personal experience, I remember uh, working with some people in a past job that had spent 15 years working in one CAD software. And then the whole entire department was moving to a new CAD software. And their constant argument was, well, in this software, I ought to, to do this function. All I had to do was this and this. And this software doesn't work like that. So it's wrong. And that is, I think, probably the most detrimental argument for yourself for learning a new software tool is expecting it to either work like exactly like your past software or saying that because it doesn't work like your past software this software is crap and it's a really really common theme people who are are very experienced in one thing and trying to move to another it's just like well that software is terrible it doesn't do this thing like this other one did and i don't even understand how it's going to work when I am sitting down to learn a new tool, the couple things that I do immediately is one, just pretend like I don't know what I'm doing. Often that's true. Um, and I do the opposite of you, Aaron. I will click around and try things, but from the start, I try to find tutorials that are either made by the software authors or uh, people who seem to be experts in the software. Because often, um, a lot of the difficulties that people are running into is they're just trying to use the software in a way it wasn't meant to be used. Right. Because they're going off of past experiences. A, a really good example of Fusion 360 is a lot of times people will try to save their project and like get a local file immediately and then try to bring that local file back in the next time they start their project and start working from that. And that's not the expected workflow for Fusion. Fusion is a cloud-based CAD system, and your project lives in the cloud, and um, all of your files live in your uh, file library on the cloud, and you work from there. And... And the only time you save a, a model down to your local machine is if you are going to export it out to something like a GitHub repo or Thingiverse, you know, and then you're translating it into either an STL or a step file or um, an F3D, which is a Fusion archive file, or an F3Z, which is um, an archive file with uh, assembly stuff, I think. You know, that's the only time you're ever pulling a model out of your Fusion library and bringing it down to your physical machine. And, and that's a huge workflow change from somebody who is used to literally any CAD software that's not Fusion 360 or on shape, because those are the, the two main cloud based ones. So it's a big paradigm change. Another thing that people will run into, especially people that are doing things like coming from a system um, like Tinkercad or 3D Builder is they don't understand why they just can't click on a feature and just move it. Because those, those two tools are um, primitive solid editors and they're not based on uh, parameters or uh, you know creating features based on sketches, uh, which is like how any actual CAD system does. Like Fusion will let you do primitive modeling, which will let you put a hole somewhere or let you um, extrude a, a primitive feature like a cylinder or a rectangle out of something. But it's not the preferred way to work. And it will cause you issues as your models get more complex down the line. You know, when, when they start working on a model, they're like, well, why can't I just move it here? In 3D Builder, I could just like click on that hole and just move it. And you know, it's it's because the system's expecting you to work in a different way that's much more accurate and 
much more um, robust. And it's just a different way of working. So the the idea of not expecting it to work like the tool you're used to and learning how, how the workflow should go um, is very important. Uh, another really good example that we have went through when we started the podcast was um, going from an audio editor like Audacity to a digital audio workstation like Reaper or yes. Audition. It's so vastly different because they're they you know, the audacity works like 3d builder where it's it's destructively editing the file so it does it in a way that's very simple um but down the line as your file gets more and more complex you're causing yourself more and more issues down the line because there's it doesn't have that history of all those changes that you made like a non-destructive editor like reaper has you know, something similar could be said for uh, paint versus something like Photoshop or GIMP. Uh, GIMP and Photoshop are non-destructive photo editors. There's always a um, original file in the background. And the way of getting to your final product is slightly more complex, but you also have more control on the way down. Like... Um, Paint has ways that you could just click a photo and be like, it's black and white now. But that photo is not black and white forever. You can't get it back. And in Photoshop, we can do you know, filters and get it very high contrast black and white and really play with the, the curves to get everything really beautiful and exactly how we want. It's more complex, but we can always get back to the beginning and undo all the work that we've done. And if we follow the proper workflow everything stays very functional. I will say my experience with GIMP, I have learned just from poking around. Mm -hmm. But with Fusion, I tried that, didn't get very far. Fusion has, has a very expected workflow. Yeah. And it was hard for me to wrap my head around it until I watched a couple Autodesk University tutorials. And once I, I watched like three classes in a row um they were how to handle components component groups and uh bodies and um how the versioning system worked and i can't remember the other one oh it was how assembly constraints work because assemblies are so different from you're constraining motion instead of um constraining uh features together it's it's so different than something like creo or solidworks does i watched those three classes and it was just like oh that's why all my models are broken because i did everything as wrong as possible hmm. okay and then i took the lessons i learned from those and the notes that i had and that was when i started modeling the i4 i sat down and i i built a really big project in fusion and just dedicated myself to learning the workflow while I built that project because I knew if I didn't, it was just going to implode on itself. And it eventually did because I did things wrong. But, um, you know, I was able to recover it because of the versioning system and get all my work back. And, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's just a matter of it's like everything else I talk about. It's managing your expectations of how the software is going to work and. Uh, working in the way that the software wants you to work and not the way you expect the software to work. You know, there are some uh, ideologies in software development that says if the user expects it to work a certain way, then you wrote it incorrectly. Uh, what? Explain. It becomes you wrote the software a certain way when the user kind of expected it to work in a different way. But but what if you're the way that you wrote the software is better and the user's just a, a jerk. I don't know. Users are the ones paying for it. That's true. It's true. And, you know, it's something like Fusion. They purposely broke the paradigm because the paradigm was broken. It was building on 30 years of practices from 2D drawing back in the 80s when Unigraphics was Unigraphics still. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of the practices that were built up out of that and 
um, the way the way Fusion worked was they they sat down and they said, "All right, this is how we're doing things now, but why?" And like every every step of the way, but why are we doing it like that? And if the answer was simply, "Well, that's just because how we've always done it," and not a good reason, they're like, "All right, scrap hmm. it. Let's look at this from the beginning now." And it some... sounds so familiar, right? I know. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if Fusion's just my really good example because I've I've worked with so many people that have come from other softwares and been like, this is just crap. And you know, we work together through the problems and they're like, oh, oh, all right. This is, this is pretty good, actually. Most of the time. Occasionally they say it's crap and they go back to SolidWorks. But yeah, personal preference and $5,000 license seats, whatever yeah. you want. <laughs> so this is also fairly applicable to software development as well. Definitely. Um, if you're new to software development or you know someone who's been learning, you may have run across something like Scratch where it's kind of a visual building block of logic to create a program. It's a great tool to learn, you know, logic and decision trees and how to make something work um, programmatically. But nobody in any capacity programs using Scratch. like in a real world scenario. Right. If you're wanting to upgrade, you know, past that, the logic will translate 100%. That's not going to change. Knowing when to use an if statement versus, you know, a for loop or a, a while loop or uh, anything like that, that's all going to stay the same. And that's going to translate to any language. Mm -hmm. You may have heard before that once you learn one programming language, you've learned them all. And that's relatively true. All languages share the same logic. They all have if statements. They all have for loops. They all have uh, different ways of setting variables and constants. So that's all going to be the same. It's just going to, you know, maybe write it differently per language. So what you do in Scratch will translate. You just might need to get comfortable uh, typing more. Uh, another really good example, e even beyond Scratch, is just Arduino code. Yeah. It's like... It feels like C, but it teaches you so many bad practices, like declaring all of your variables as globals. Uh, <laughs> um, and I remember when I f went to my first legit software class and had been doing Arduino for like a year, like really hardcore. I got really into it for a while. And then, you know, I go into the C++ class and my teacher's like, you can't declare all of your variables as globals. And I was like, sure I can. <laughs> it works fine. And we were both right. You know, it did work fine for my little like hello world badge scanner program. But as soon as you're trying to do real world code where you have to manage memory, you can't do that. <laughs> That's not okay. Yeah. But I wanted to argue with her. Because my code worked. <laughs> Having your code work is only half the battle. Right. Yeah. And see, I didn't know that. So I wanted to argue about it and I was all mad. And this was before I had, had you know, developed my philosophy of looking at it from the, uh, the intended point of view rather than my own point of view. Um, but that, like, that's my best example for software. Going from a really simplistic thing like Arduino and then having to go... Do it yeah. for realsies. Arduino is a good stepping point from scratch. I would also recommend something like Python, which is a uh, a much more lenient language. Yes. It's not as uh, syntax strict as some other languages are. When you're writing Python, it you feel like you're writing more pseudocode or English sentences. When yes. You code it. Um, and it's also uh, much more universal. You can use it on any, pretty much any OS that has a Python interpreter on it it'll be much more applicable for uh, any sort of employment or job. It's amazing how relevant Python has become recently. Yes, it has gotten so popular, yeah. mostly due to uh, data science and analytics. Um, stuff like NumPy and Pandas have really, really exploded in popularity. R was the data science language, but I'm pretty sure Python's starting to beat it out now. Because Python's uh, meant to be a universal scripting language. Yeah. And if you know anything about, you know, universal generic things, 
computers used to be super specialized. And once the uh, personal computer, the PC came out, which is a general purpose computer, now they're in all the offices and everybody has a personal computer and it's hard to not operate a PC nowadays. And that's kind of how Python's going. It's now it's a general purpose scripting language. So you can do data science, you can make a Python script to run your Raspberry Pi, you can create an entire application in Python that can control your 3D printer and you can call it Octoprint. Uh, you can make a whole software that can automate your home and you can call it Home Assistant, which is all based on Python. Yeah, what was the... There's a really great IBM quote about computers that is funny based on what you just said about how it's hard to not... Nobody ever got fired from buying IBM? <laughs> no. Because that's uh, a quote. <laughs> I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. <laughs> uh, it was Thomas Watson, president of IBM in 1943. <laughs> Where did yeah. your quote come from? Oh, it's legit. Um, it's also from like the 80s and 90s, where if you're not sure about buying uh, IT hardware, nobody ever got fired from buying IBM. That That's literally a quote. Wow, okay. Yeah, it, I, I really... I really think the biggest thing that you could take away from all of this is is just, you know, have patience when you're learning a new tool and just don't expect it to work exactly like your old tool. Every tool is different. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is don't switch to a new tool when it's critical. If you have to complete this you know, project in a tight deadline, that is not the project to switch to a whole new system of completion. Yes. And that will that will manage your success much better than being like, well, I've got this new project I should take on. Maybe I should try out this whole new software system with a whole new methodology to accomplish that in one week. It would normally take me a week in my current software that I'm an expert in. I should do this one. <laughs> yeah. I was originally planning on uh, doing all the back end for the access control system in Go. Because I've been wanting to learn Go, which is a, a, a scripting language from uh, Google. I have no experience with it, and I might have typed like one function in Go so far. And I wanted to use it as an opportunity to learn, but I really just want to get this project done. Yeah. And I want to make sure production ready. And I have a decent amount of experience in Python, you know, at an enterprise level. So if I really care about getting this thing done and making it, you know, somewhat decent and getting it done in a relatively, you know, decent time, I should just do it in Python. And I think that's what I'm going to do. Probably. That's probably the right idea. It's not as much fun, right? But yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's important to, um, I guess, manage your tasks and like, you know, if it's going to, if learning that new tool is going to hold you back from completing your project, it's probably not the right time to learn the new tool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess with all that, are we are we done? I think we are. I think we're done. I think anymore we're gonna get ranty and people are gonna be like, "Nah, these makers on tap, guys. They talk too much." All right. Well, um, we had a ton of good discussion on Twitter lately uh, with between me and Aaron and the makers on tap community. Uh, keep it up. It's been a lot of fun talking to people who are listening to the show and have good feedback on the show and are giving uh, giving us topics to talk about. Um, I was super excited as soon as I joined that group tonight and Alex was like, hey, <laughs> I know you. I was like, oh, man, I'm famous. I want to be recognized. Maybe you should be on Facebook again, Aaron. People would recognize That's you. a mistake. Yeah. Well, y'all yeah. should leave Facebook. Well, you know, that's where the world's at. And one of us has to stay on it. <laughs> All right. With that, guys, keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. <laughs>